In the opening scene, Alvin skateboards across the road and into a shop. He's wearing apparently identical elbow and knee protectors to the ones that Compo borrowed with a skateboard in the Christmas 1978 special Small Tune on a Penny Wassail. Alvin is also wearing the same pads in the series 27 episode How to Remove a Cousin when he meets Billy to go skateboarding. Billy's trousers are shredded by a dog, but in the next episode he's wearing identical, undamaged trousers. Does Billy seem like the type of person who has several pairs the same? Well, it does help continuity if the costume doesn't change, so the costume department will have several identical sets of clothes for the characters. There's always a dry outfit if someone gets wet or just needs a clean costume, and then there are duplicates for the stunt performers and stand-ins. Both Jameson Street and Pepworth Street are fake road names, although we only see a sign for Pepworth Street. Dora Bryan is named in the opening credits, but does not appear in the episode. The location filming of regular episodes usually took place over a few weeks in and around Homefirth, with scenes being filmed for several different episodes in each location as required. Some of the Christmas episodes were filmed separately, and it's very obvious that this episode was one of those. Much of the location filming was done in Brick House, not Homefirth. This episode was originally titled Congratulations, You've Won a Thousand Pounds Off a Fitted Kitchen. This is the first episode filmed in digital eye definition. Clegg's cousin is seen in Berry Bank Rise, one of the fake street names used. The quartet try and retrieve a bottle from the river. On the first attempt, Alvin falls in waist deep and later down the stream, Alvin seems to be dry as he and Entwistle hang Billy over the stream from a bridge and drop him in head first. In their next scene, Billy's already dry and it's only now that it occurs to them to use the ladder that has been in the back of the truck all this time. Alvin gets wet again but catches the bottle. Later in the pub he's ripped his trousers although he does seem to be dry again. In the pub the man sitting on the corner of the bar is also seen sitting at the window table in consecutive shots. In the opening scene, Truly, Alvin and Clegg are walking across a field, with Billy trailing behind them. Clegg turns to talk to Billy, then walks on and out of camera shot. We next see him sitting on the wall. It's not Clegg in the first part of the scene, but he's double. So he has his head down and Billy is trailing so that Clegg has to turn his back on the camera to speak and then walks out of shot, until the camera reveals the real Clegg already sitting on the wall. This is likely due to Peter Salas' declining sight and to reduce the physical effort. Billy says he's currently between bicycles, so Howard offers to loan his. However, later, Howard is out on his bike with Marina, so where did Billy find a bike? Unusually, the theme tune for this episode does not feature harmonica. It is more melodic, with noticeably more strings. Green screen has been used for the shots of Alvin and Marina outside the Monkey Pub. The lighting cameraman has done a good job matching the lighting conditions, but there are some green screen artefacts on Marina's hair and the edges of clothing. On the 2nd of October 2007, last of the Summer Wine composer Ronnie Hazelhurst passed away. However, his name remained in the credits as the theme tune and some of his other original music continued to be used. This episode features Eric Sykes in a rare appearance without his trademark spectacles, which did not have lenses in anyway. When the menfolk leave the pub with drunken Doggy, Clegg is not with them, and when they are pushing Doggy in the cart, Clegg, or possibly his double, is some way behind, not always in shot. This looks like another occasion when Peter Salas' role was reduced to cut some of the physical effort. This episode is one of the rare occasions a car is seen in a studio environment. Nellie's car is parked outside the cafe on location. As it's too big to be obscured by the cafe curtains, it's also on set for the studio interior shots. The office typist chairs that Tom and Smiler are transporting on the handcart have the caster wheels rigged so that they roll down the road in a straight line. When Entwistle and Alvin are in the library, there are posters for a book titled Behind You by Linda Reagan, who is Brian Murphy's wife. Linda Reagan is best known for her role as Yellowcoat April in the BBC sitcom Heidi High. 
Tom and Smiler drive Auntie's milk float down a road with the fictitious name Donaldson Street. In series 28 and 29, Barry's car is a blue 2006 Citroen C3 Desire, but in this episode he drives a grey 2006 Ford Focus LX, the only time this car is seen. First PC Ken Kitson is shown twice in the end credits. There is often a framed photograph of Edie on Barry and Glenda's mantelpiece. Thora Heard passed away in March 2003, so from this episode there's a new photo of Edie on the mantelpiece taken from the Series 24 episode, The Secret Birthday of Norman Clegg. Brian Connolly played Boothroyd, a neighbour of Barry and Glenda, who was a Keep Fit fanatic. The role was originally offered to Russ Abbott. This episode was dedicated to Brian Wilde, who had died earlier in the year. When Clegg talks about Howard eating a bicycle, Howard is drinking a cup of tea and the brandy snap disappears from his plate. PC Cooper tells Walsh he is sleeping in the spare bedroom, but in the Series 17 episode, The First Human Being to Ride a Hill, we had learnt he is divorced. In the Series 29 episode, a short introduction to Cooper's rules, Cooper does say he loves his wife, but only in a pretend radio message to disguise the fact that he and Walsh are skiving again. Alvin tells Howard and Mr Chislehurst that the most powerful single weapon for attracting ladies over a certain age is Maurice Chevalier impressions. This is something Compo knew about in the series 12 episode The Last Surviving Maurice Chevalier Impression, when his attempt to impress Nora was sabotaged by one of his ferrets. Alvin's advice works for Mr Chislehurst, but Howard finds Pearl is less enthusiastic. This episode was originally broadcast on the 24th of August 2008 to mark the 10th anniversary of Compo's death. Clegg reveals the date on the calendar for this episode is Friday the 27th of June 2008. Compo died in the series 21 episode Elegy for Fallen Wellies broadcast on the 23rd of April 2000, so it was more like eight years and two months. Bill Owen died on the 12th of July 1999, so it was still only nine years since the actor's death. It's possible Roy Clark wanted to make sure this episode was made in view of the reducing budgets and continued lack of support from the BBC in case a further series was not commissioned. All of the other episodes in series 29 have a copyright date on the end captions of 2008 MMVIII, but this episode is copyright 2007 MMVII. It makes it look like this episode was originally filmed and planned to appear as part of series 28 and was held over, or it could be a typo. Part of the evidence for it being a typo is that the police car used in this episode is the same as all the other episodes of series 29. Different police cars were used in series 28 and 30. However, the BBC's programme as completed form for this episode confirms it was made as part of series 29, filmed between June and October 2007, while series 28 was being broadcast. The audience recording was on the 17th of November 2007. This episode was dedicated to Cathy Staff, who died two weeks before the episode aired. Although producers knew that ill health meant that Cathy Staff would not rejoin the show, the script avoided making this obvious by Stella making references that suggested Nora would be returning from Australia. Russ Abbott makes his first appearance as Luther Hobbo Hobdyke, the ex-milkman who claims to have worked for MI5. It's no coincidence that Hobbo and Abbott's earlier comic spy creation, Basil and Bond, have similar traits. Roy Clark had written a pilot episode for a Basil and Bond series called 008 The Real James Bond. In the final two series, Clegg and Truly only appear in short scenes filmed in the studio. Their appearances on location were achieved with stand-ins for the long shots and green screen in the studio for close-ups. Clegg and Truly recall that Hobbo was never much of a milkman but was exemplary at needlework. In an episode of Open All Hours, Mrs. The Widow Featherston says her husband was excellent at embroidery. 
Barry is not keen on his new, reduced price, executive pinstripe suit, despite having bought a similar one in the Series 22 episode Enter the Hawk that Glenda said she hated. He even bought another one from Auntie Wainwright in the Series 25 episode Barry Becomes a Psychopathic Killer But Only Part-Time. Members of the crew were sometimes used as extras in the background of pub scenes or like the passerby asking the PCs for direction. Even designer Stefan Paxi appears in an episode as a pub customer. Nellie takes Pearl out on a motorbike in this episode and again in the following episode will Stella find true love with Norris Furburn. Nellie had previously shown no inclination or aptitude as a biker let alone knowing where to borrow a motorbike. In Hepton Stall's shed, the wide shots show Hobbo has his back to the empty wall sitting next to Alvin. In shots from the side showing Hepton Stall, Hobbo is clearly sitting next to Hepton Stall and behind him is a folded up deck chair. When the police drive into the church car park and see Hobbo, Alvin and Entwistle climb over the wall into the churchyard, the police car is really the opposite side of the church and would not be able to see them. In Roy Clark's 1987 novel, The Moonbather, Howard and Pearl's surname is Sibshaw, but it's only mentioned once in the TV show in this episode when Glenda refers to Howard as Mr Sibshaw. This episode, first broadcast on BBC One on the 29th of August 2010, was referred to as the very last of the summer wine in TV listings and TV trailers, but not in the actual episode itself. A big day now on BBC One Wales, together with the BBC HD channel. And to say cheers for 37 years of comedy, it's only fitting that we raise a glass to the very last of the summer wine. Oh, you're out early. <laughs> hairdressers. She was booked up. Marina and Miss Davenport are seen leaving the hairdressers, just before trying to impress Morton and Toby Mulberry-Smith with their new hairstyles. The hairdressers is just a normal house with the same signs in the window that were used in an earlier episode where a cafe near the library location was used as the exterior for the hairdressers. This final episode included all the current regular characters except Ivy. It seems that Jane Freeman was unwell when this episode was filmed. The brief appearances of Truly and Clegg in the pub were filmed on a set in the studio and by using green screen. Clegg and Truly's final scene in the bus is also green screen with a further layer of green screen to add Glenda and Barry in the row of seats in front of them. There was an army of directors, producers, technicians and crew, 450 credited actors, 16 stunt arrangers and performers, the Barnsley College of Technology Band, the Dodworth Colliery Band, the Home Silver Band, Homeforth Choral Society, the Homeforth Golden Girl Majorettes, the Homeforth Model Flying Club, the Queensbury Scouts Marching Band, the Mike Sam Singers, about 10 dogs, several donkeys, several horses, several ferrets and innumerable uncredited background performers just there to bring Roy Clark's scripts to life.